What are you planning to do about the pimples in your scalp? You're gonna watch this video, that's what you're gonna do, because that's exactly what we're gonna talk about, a deep dive on why you're getting acne in your scalp. I say that in air quotes because, trust me, nine times out of 10, this is not acne, but rather it's most likely folliculitis. What is folliculitis? It is essentially inflammation around the hair follicle that can lead to little pimples that oftentimes itch quite a bit. Often more problematic along the frontal hairline, but really can happen anywhere on your scalp. For the most part, most cases are caused by staph bacteria, bacterial folliculitis. You can also have a folliculitis, however, related to everyone's favorite friend, you guessed it, malassezia yeast. Malassezia folliculitis, otherwise known as pterosperm folliculitis, commonly people refer to as fungal acne, but it's really just, well, a type of folliculitis that can happen anywhere, but the scalp has a lot of malassezia yeast, hence dandruff, hence folliculitis. And rarely you can develop little itchy bumps of folliculitis related to <laughs> demodex mites. Yes, we have mites that live in our hair follicles. They're most abundant on our scalp. Some people's immune responses to those little mites are quite robust. Not only the mites, but the mites have a little bacteria that live on them, which also can be a nuisance for your, your immune system to cope with. What exactly can you do about this? Well, see a board certified dermatologist because while these are some of the most common types of folliculitis, there are many others. There are less common, although common enough that we see them a lot as dermatologists, scalp conditions related to folliculitis that are entirely different. A lot of cases of garden variety bacterial folliculitis do resolve on their own with no treatment. A complication of having folliculitis is that, well, it's itchy. Anything that is itchy becomes very, very, very difficult not to scratch. However, the penalty for scratching many times is a secondary skin infection. You introduce bacteria, yes, more bacteria, from your hands, from your nails, directly into the skin, and you get, well, impetigo. Impetigo is a condition I also have a video on, so check that out if that's something that you have been told you have. Things that can aggravate folliculitis include wearing tight caps, head scarves, scalp oils may also aggravate these conditions as well. Wearing tight hairstyles is not a good idea if you are in the throes of a scalp folliculitis because the tight hairstyles put a lot of tension on the scalp itself and the hair follicles and can bring in even more inflammation and further aggravate this process for you. So stick to loose hairstyles while you are dealing with this and try and avoid tight fitted hats. Like I said, this tends to be a real nuisance on the front of the scalp. Stay away from headbands. I like to wear a headband when I do my skincare routine, but if I had folliculitis, I would ditch that. Also, speaking of headwear, if you are dealing with a folliculitis, make sure you are washing all of your hats, scarves, headbands, etc., so that you don't reintroduce, say, staph bacteria back into your skin. But make sure you are not only washing those things, but that you are not sharing them with other people. This also includes your hair towels, things that you use to dry your hair. Speaking of drying your hair, try and avoid heat heat styling that further can bring in even more inflammation and agitate not only the skin condition, but may potentially compromise skin barrier integrity, make you vulnerable for recurrences. So try and take a break from heat styling. That includes a blow dryer, flat iron, curling iron, hot rollers. Now at the beginning of the video, I emphasized how important it is to see a dermatologist to figure out what it is you're dealing with. And I know people will say, I can't get in to see a dermatologist. I don't have a dermatologist anywhere near me. Trust me. I know this is a big, big issue. But one of the other reasons why it's important to have an accurate diagnosis going in is that some people get recurrent bouts of folliculitis that require prescription treatments, or sometimes the causative agent is particularly stubborn and a culture needs to be obtained. A culture is basically taking a swab of maybe the pus material and sending it to the lab, figure out who exactly is up in there. Yes, it's staph, but what, what flavor of staph, so to speak, so that we we could better target the treatment so that you don't deal with recurrent bouts of this. Many people actually have staph bacteria, certain strains of staph bacteria in their nose, and they require a topical antibiotic to not only treat the scalp problem, but to treat their nose to prevent recurrences. What do we do to treat bacterial folliculitis? Topical antibiotics can clear it up, such as mupirocin. In some cases, if the bacterial folliculitis goes deep down in the hair follicle, 
follicle, a course of oral antibiotics may be necessary. Mild topical steroids can also be prescribed to help with the itch. Because again, scratching is going to jeopardize your progress, but it's very hard not to scratch when things are itchy. Topical steroids can help silence the itch. The other treatment that we prescribe probably will blow your mind. You may even be put off by the idea of it, but it definitely can make a difference for a lot of people. That is oral isotretinoin. Isotretinoin is a prescription retinoid, sometimes referred to as Accutane. It helps normalize cell turnover within the hair follicle. One of the other reasons why isotretinoin can be particularly useful for people who deal with recurrent bouts of pterosporin folliculitis related to, well, malassezia yeast, is that that little yeast really, really, really loves all of the sebum, S-E-B-U-M, not the bodybuilder, or sebum. That little yeast really thrives in the oils of your scalp, and isotretinoin helps to cut down on oiliness. So it really can help particularly with malassezia folliculitis, as well as um, other conditions related to that little yeast. What all is available that you could buy in the store over the counter that might help you out? Well, first of all, if you are dealing with a bacterial folliculitis in particular related to, say, staph bacteria, as is common, there is a topical antiseptic that you can buy without a prescription that can really, really help. It's kind of a pain to use. And no, I'm not going to say benzoyl peroxide, although yes, that actually can help. But unfortunately, benzoyl peroxide will bleach your hair and is pretty drying. So not easy to use in the scalp. There's another topical antiseptic, however, called betadine surgical scrub. Betadine surgical scrub, you can get at your pharmacy, you can get on Amazon. And the way to use it is get yourself like a large cotton swab and just paint it into your hairline, into your scalp, part your hair, and really let it sit on there, you know, maybe 10, 15 minutes. And this really can help cut down on staph bacteria. While it doesn't stain your hair, like benzoyl peroxide bleaches your hair, you will see it because this is brownish, orangish color, you will see it wherever you put it on. What's a good shampoo for scalp folliculitis? Do I need a specific shampoo? You might not. If you were dealing with a bacterial folliculitis, don't worry about what a good shampoo is. Just use whatever shampoo you like. Make sure you rinse all the shampoo out. You don't leave shampoo residue behind in the scalp that could further irritate it. Make sure when you shampoo, you're not using scalding hot water. Things that actually end up drying out your scalp put you at greater risk for bacterial folliculitis because they impair the barrier and allow better entry for bacteria. That being said, there are several medicated shampoos. Yes, they're going to be the dandruff shampoos because the medicated shampoos that you buy over the counter, they're dandruff shampoos, all right? But dandruff shampoos, they get around, all right? They get around and they can help a lot of conditions. So, for example, a salicylic acid anti-dandruff shampoo like Neutrogena T-Sal, that's the one I recommend, I like, I've used it myself, it's good, it's free of fragrance. But if you have your favorite salicylic acid shampoo, by all means. Salicylic acid shampoo can be helpful if you deal with the Demodex folliculitis because it may cut down on some scalp buildup that ultimately fuels more Demodex proliferation. Salicylic acid shampoo may also, to a certain extent, be somewhat useful for malassezia folliculitis as well. Probably not going to cure bacterial folliculitis. Honestly, it won't cure any of these, but it has anti-inflammatory effects on the scalp and may be helpful. Ketoconazole shampoo, so I'll learn the brand name Nizorol, can be helpful for malassezia folliculitis. And then you also have a coal tar shampoo, which is anti-inflammatory, maybe soothing, help tremendously with the scalp itch factor. Now, the coal tar shampoo I recommend is from the brand MG217. Why is it whenever you mention itchy scalp, it's like a reflex, you start scratching your scalp. MG217 coal tar shampoo, anti-inflammatory, soothing, stinks, however smells foul. So that's a good option as well. Then you have zinc pyrithione. That is an anti-dandruff ingredient that can help with malassezia folliculitis, reduce recurrences. But honestly, any shampoo that you use can help just by removing excess oil and keeping the scalp clean. The other thing that's really important though is washing hats, washing headwear, not sharing headwear, washing your towels and things. Anything that regularly comes in contact with your scalp, make sure you are washing it in hot soapy water. Now, Another topical antiseptic that you might be curious about for the scalp is called chlorhexidine, hibiclens. I actually have a video all about hibiclens, but you need to be careful about 
hemoclons, aka chlorhexidine, on the scalp because if it gets into your ear or into your, you know, around your eye, it can be a very damaging. So I don't recommend that. I think it's better to use um, betadine surgical scrub for the scalp. The last little pearl I want to leave you with to further illustrate to you how little pimples that pop up in, in the scalp can be a variety of different things. A scalp condition that a lot of doctors actually miss, it's pretty easy to miss. They might brush off as a garden variety bacterial uh, folliculitis if they're not careful, okay? They can miss this diagnosis. Is you can actually have shingles um, in your scalp and it looks, you know, if you just, especially if you have a lot of hair, all right, and all of a sudden you have these pimples in your scalp and they just take a look, they see a pimple or two and they're like, oh yeah, bacterial folliculitis, here you go, here's a topical antibiotic. And they're not careful, could actually be shingles. I have seen many cases of shingles in the scalp look exactly, exactly like a bacterial folliculitis at first glance. But when you take a careful look at the pattern in which they are erupting and you look very carefully at the pimple, the features of it, um, you're not quick to examine the patient. You really look thoroughly, you're like, oh my God, this is, this, this is shingles. This ladies and gentlemen is shingles really important because shingles in this area can ultimately go on to affect your eye you know involve parts of your face um, and so that's one that I have seen misdiagnosed shingles in contrast to bacterial fungal demodex folliculitis it starts out as like this sharp shooting tingling sensation sometimes it's, it's often very painful like when you go to scratch shingles you feel these like little static electricity like feeling a sensation through Throughout your skin it's very uncomfortable very painful and then later on you can have very swollen lymph nodes so it's much different it's only going to affect one side of your scalp it's not going to be both sides so that's another clue and shingles does not come and go all right most people get shingles they it runs its course I have a video on shingles as a side note most people it runs its course and then that's it it doesn't come back technically yes it can come back at some later point in life unless you have a suppressed immune system you know like you're a trans transplant patient, you're going through some kind of cancer treatment, one of those less common circumstances. For otherwise healthy people who deal with a bout of shingles, that's, you know, it runs its course, that's it. So that's kind of a little how to tell. Symptoms, appearance, aka morphology, course, the location, these little things. All right, y'all, that's about what I wanted to talk about for today's video. I often get questions, can this be used for scalp acne? And my response to you is going to be, it's probably not actually acne in your scalp, but rather folliculitis and then the other question is what type of folliculitis do you have that is one of the most important things to getting it to go away is knowing exactly what you have going on up there but i hope this information helps you guys out today's video was focused on the scalp but uh spoiler alert you can get folliculitis on your body back buttocks in particular legs you name it you can get a folliculitis anywhere where you have hair follicles uh and a lot of people think they're dealing with acne and they're not i actually have a video all about folliculitis on the body. I give more pointers there because there are some other things that you might be doing that are spreading this around. So watch that video next so you're better informed with regards to folliculitis. I'll put it on the end slate, which is basically the still slide that appears once I disappear. You just click on that thumbnail and it'll take you to the video. But if you guys enjoyed this one, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and as always, don't forget, sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye! Mm -hmm.